In this presentation, we will consider the chapters in Jeremiah of chapters 30 through 33, chapter 36, and then in Lamentations, chapters 1 and 3. As always, I'd read the chapters before you listen to the podcast so you know the details of what's going on and it will probably uh, have a lot more meaning to you. Let's begin with a little introduction. Chapters 30 through 33 deal with the prophets' predictions of the restoration of Israel and Judah in the last days of the Lord's making a new and everlasting covenant with them. They have great meaning for Latter-day Saints and should be studied carefully. Ezra Taft Benson spoke of the Latter-day Gathering as having, quoting now Ezra Benson, three phrases, the gathering of Israel to the land of Zion, the American Hemisphere, the return of the ten tribes from the countries of the north, and the reestablishment of the Jews in Palestine as God's chosen people. This miracle of the return of the Jews was to be one of the events to precede Christ's second coming, and the scriptures are very clear with reference to this fact. Isaiah said that they shall gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth and set them in their own land, that they will build the old waste and repair the waste cities. Jeremiah, who predicted so clearly their dispersion, also states that the Lord will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it and build them as at the first. So, let's start with chapter 30. Let's take a look at verses 3 and 8. In the last days, the Lord will gather Israel. Jeremiah 30, verse 3, has several meanings. It refers to the return of the Jews after 70 years of captivity in Babylon. It also refers to the restoration of the Jews to their homeland in the last days, after they have been scattered for the second time. And it refers to the return of the lost tribes from the lands of the north. Note that the Lord will bring them. The yoke spoken of in verse 8 is the yoke of oppression of King Nebuchadnezzar. Doctrine and Covenants section 113 verses 9 through 10 explains what the bonds are that are spoken of in Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 8. Now these are actually questions that were asked about Isaiah, but the bonds that bind that Isaiah described they'd be bound by and Jeremiah describes are the same. So Doctrine and Covenants 113 says, What are we to understand by Zion loosing herself from the bands of her neck? Verse 10, we are to understand that the scattered remnants are exhorted to return to the Lord from whence they have fallen. Which if they do, the Lord, the promise of the Lord is that he will speak to them or give them revelation. See verse 6, 7, and verse 8th verse. The bands of the necks are the curses of God upon her, or the remnants of Israel and their scattered condition among the Gentiles. And so today we are loosening the bands on the neck of Judah and Israel by bringing them out of captivity and helping them to return. Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 9, the latter-day king, I'm sorry, the latter-day David, king of Israel. Once again, there is a mention of the latter-day David who will be king in Israel. Sometimes he is called the branch because Jesus, who is the king of David of the latter days, is a branch of the ancient line of King David. And so the David of the latter days who will rule and reign is no other than Jesus Christ himself. Gospel principle, one day Christ will take his rightful place as king over all. Jeremiah 30 verses 11 through 24. In the latter days ye shall fully understand. It is the Lord Jesus Christ who saves. He is Israel's Savior and Redeemer. He does not, however, ignore the sins of his people. See verse 11. 
The lovers who forgot Israel were the false gods that Jehovah's unfaithful wife, Israel, sought after. No one came to the rescue but the Lord, who has always loved Israel, and who promised, They, the Chaldeans that devour thee, shall be devoured by the Medes and Persians. The Assyrians were destroyed by the Babylonians, the Babylonians by the Medes and Persians, the Egyptians and Persians by the Greeks. All these empires have now vanished, but the Jews still exist as a distinct people. In the latter days, Israel will be the Lord's people, and he will be their God as he desired in the beginning. The Lord promised Israel, in the latter days shall ye consider, meaning fully understand, it. Now only in the latter days, as these promises are realized, can one fully understand what Jeremiah and other prophets were saying. We get to see the fulfillment of these prophecies, of these great prophets, of gathering Israel together again from their dispersed state. Jeremiah, let's go to chapter 31, verses 1 through 9, the Latter-day Gathering of Israel. 31.1, at the same time, that phrase, the same time meaning as chapter 30, that is, the latter days, will begin again to be the God of Israel and they his people by restoring the gospel and gathering in the long dispersed of Israel. So chapter 31, as far as the time period, is just a continuation of the time period of chapter 30 of this gathering. 32.2, the people left of the sword, meaning a remnant of Israel, Ephraim, would be left to be gathered. This isn't interesting that the process of the gathering is that Ephraim would come in first because Ephraim holds the keys to direct the church and the gathering. And so that's why you see mostly members of the church that are the tribe of Ephraim. We are now slowly seeing more and more of other tribes slowly trickling in. But Ephraim was gathered first to go out and then find the rest of the family. 33 verses 3 through 5. In the latter days, Israel returned to their God because of his loving kindness of his everlasting covenant with them. Israel shall once again rejoice like one in dance and song and be able to partake of the fruit of their labors. 33, 6 through 7. The watchmen mentioned in verse 6 are the righteous prophets of the latter days. See Ezekiel 3, 16 to 21. He talks about that too. In the last dispensation, they will cry to all people to join together in proper worship of the Lord. President Nelson is very emphatic, right? Join us. Join us in the great gathering of Israel. 33.8, verse 8, speaks of gathered Israel coming from the north country, which seems to refer to the ten tribes. Look what it says in Doctrine and Covenants 1.10.11 and 1.32.26. Verse 1.10, or checks in 1.10. After this vision closed, the heavens were again opened unto us, and Moses appeared before us and committed unto us the keys of the gathering of Israel from the four parts of the earth and the leading of the ten tribes from the land of the north. Two different things. They're not the same events. So, so when it says a people come from the land of the north, that seems to always refer to the coming back of the ten tribes. Now, 133.26, And they who are in the north countries shall come in remembrance before the Lord, and their prophets shall hear his voice, and shall no longer stay themselves. And they shall smite the rocks, and ice shall flow down at their presence. And so, in verse 8 of Jeremiah 33, when he says, Israel come from the north country, that is in specific reference to the ten tribes. Right now, we are just gathering out dispersed Israel. There is yet to be great events, miraculous events, of the ten tribes coming back in conjunction with us gathering out the remnants of Israel. And also, Jeremiah said, and from the coast, meaning the ends of the earth. So in other words, Jeremiah is seen to gather, and just like it says in Doctrine and Covenants 1, 10, 11, that would gather Israel from all the ends of the earth, all the coasts from the coast, from the four parts, and we would gather the ten tribes from the north countries. 
Jeremiah 31, 1 through 9, the latter day gathering of Israel. 31, verse 9, Ephraim will come with tears, contrition, with tears, contrition, and joy. God will not forget the house of Joseph, the head of northern Israel. Le Grand Richard said of this gathering, I will bring them, a great company shall return thither. This was something the Lord was going to do. Note that Jeremiah does not say that they will turn hither or to the place where his prediction was made, but thither or to a distant place. He understood that Joseph was to be given a new land in the utmost bounds of the everlasting hills, which is the American continent. Verse 9 refers to Israel returning with weeping. They will weep because they will realize that the sufferings they have endured throughout the centuries came about because they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall lead them in the last days. Isn't that the reason, when it comes down to it, of all of our weeping? is because either our lack of faith or understanding of Jesus Christ. Gospel principle, the gathering of Israel has been taking place since the rest of the race of the gospel and will continue with great power and authority. Jeremiah 31, 10 through 14, they shall not sorrow any more. These verses picture the great joy and happiness that will accompany the return of Israel. The promises of great abundance, verse 12, and rejoicing, verse 13, and the end of sorrow, verses 15 through 16, are exactly opposite to the promises given in other chapters of tragedy, desolation, and lamentation for Judah. Though Judah did not heed Jeremiah's warning and his dire predictions came to pass, the hope of a brighter day was clearly given here. And so, maybe the only hope Jeremiah had, he knew doom was coming to the immediate future of Judah. But he saw in the latter days, they would one day return, the gospel would be restored, and they would come unto it. While the ultimate fulfillment of these verses is yet in the future, Elder Legrand Richard saw a parallel between verses 7 through 14 and the early history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The saints left Nauvoo with weeping and with supplications. They did not leave their beautiful homes because they wanted to. He saw the rivers of water they walked by in a straight way as being the North Platte River, by which they traveled about 600 miles. Singing in the height of Zion refers to the tabernacle choir, according to Elder Richards. This morning being, their mourning being turned into joy, verse 13, refers to the saints finding joy with one another in dancing and other activities as well as in testimony meetings. So, so you can see a lot of different fulfillments of these prophecies by these prophets. While the members of the priesthood in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints are not paid for their services, and thousands of them have left their families for years to do a time at a time to do missionary work in the nations of the earth, paying their own expenses and without remuneration from the church, yet in their hearts they feel they are better paid than any other religious leader in the world, because of the joy and satisfaction the Lord plants in their hearts, which could not possibly be purchased with money. Thus he has satiated the soul of the priest with fatness, and his people are satisfied with his goodness. Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 15 through 17, it talks about Rachel weeping for her children. Chapter 31, verse 15, Rachel, the beloved spouse of Jacob, earnestly desired children. She is here depicted as bitterly weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because she had none, for they had been taken captive. The mourning which took place at Ramah, which on account of some unrecorded butchery there on the part of the Chaldean conquerors, or in reference to their general cruelty to the exiles there assembled for deportation to Babylon, is referred to by Matthew in chapter 2, verse 17, as a forecast of the wailing at the slaughter of the innocents by Herod. 
Remember when he tries to kill the Savior when he's born? The appropriateness of calling upon Rachel to weep in Ramah consists in this, that she, the one of Jacob's wives, who had so ardently longed for children, and the mother of Joseph, and so of Ephraim and Manasseh, whose lot was with Judah, shall lament the overthrow of her offspring in a conspicuous border town of the two kingdoms, with both of which she was thus immediately connected. The great scholar Kylan Delich commented, saying, The lamentation of Rachel is heard at Ramah as the most lofty situated border town of the two kingdoms, whence the wailing that had arisen sounded far and near and could be heard in Judah. The destruction of the people of Israel by the Assyrians and Chaldeans is a type of the massacre of the infants at Bethlehem as cited by Matthew in the Gospels. Insofar as the sin which brought the children of exile, I'm sorry, the children of Israel into exile laid a foundation for the fact that Herod the Indomian became king over the Jews and wished to destroy the true king and savior of Israel that he might strengthen his own dominion. 31 verse 16, the work shall be rewarded, meaning Rachel, by the death of her descendants, had, as it were, been deprived of the reward for which she had labored in bearing and bringing up children. Now, by their restoration, she has at last received her recompense. 31 17, in the end, meaning in the latter days, there will be hope for Ephraim as thy children once again be gathered. Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 18 through 7 through 21. 31 18, Ephraim, that is the northern kingdom, which for over 100 years had been devastated by the Assyrians and its people exiled, was chastened by Jehovah for the purpose of turning them back to the Lord. Christ and the Father never punishes us out of, out of sheer anger, and he's just mad. No, the punishment is always to help drive us back into their arms. It's, if we're wise enough to use it as that, that's up to us. 3119, Northern Israel was instructed by the things which it suffered, punishment under the hands of the Assyrians. I smote upon my thigh means is in reference to Ephraim's contrition because of its shame occurred through the sins of his youth. 3120. God is represented as addressing himself even as a father might do when dwelling upon the ingratitude and rebellion of a son whom nevertheless he cannot but continue to love deeply. That's why he says my bowels. And in the end, meaning the latter days, will have mercy. 3121, the high heaps are referenced to the guidepost for the returning exiles. What are the guideposts that would guide Israel to come back into the restoration of the gospel? Well, that will be the scriptures, the Book of Mormon, and his prophets, right? That will guide them back in, missionaries. Jeremiah 3122, what is meant by a woman shall compass a man. Many times in Hebrew writing, Israel is described as a woman and sometimes as a bride. The marriage relationship between the woman Israel and her husband, the Lord Jesus Christ, is used to depict a very tender, intimate association. The Lord used this relationship numerous times in the scriptures as an example of his commitment to care for, protect, and bless his covenant people. Kylan Delich explained, In the verse now before us, the Hebrew word translated compass, signifies to encompass with love and care, to surround lovingly and carefully, the natural and fitting dealing on the part of the stronger to the weak and those who need assistance. And the new thing that God creates consists in this, that the woman, the weaker nature that needs help, will lovingly and solicitously surround the man, the stronger. Herein is expressed a new relation of Israel to the Lord, a reference to a new covenant which the Lord gives. That's verse 31. 
will conclude with his people, in which he deals so condescendingly towards them that they can lovingly embrace him. This is the substance of the messianic meaning in the words. What a great reference to the new and everlasting covenant that would be restored, and that we would be able to encompass the Savior and embrace him because of his loving kindness towards us. Gospel principle. In our covenant relationship with Christ, we feel of the full effects of his love. Jeremiah 31, 23 through 40, the return of the southern kingdom, Judah. So the first part of 31 is, the, is about Ephraim, the northern kingdom be restored. Now he turns to Judah. The Lord now turns from Ephraim to Judah and promises her like blessings. 31, 23 through 26, Judah will one day be brought out of captivity, blessed with justice and holiness, where the people will be able to dwell in peace. 31, 27 through 30, in the latter days, Israel and Judah will prosper and increase. Just as Jehovah had watched over Israel's demise, so too would he watch over their return. The proverb quoted in verse 30, which was common among the Jews, induced them to throw upon their predecessors the responsibility for their misdeeds. Accordingly, the prophet restates in an amended form the truth which it embodies. It was true that their fathers had sinned, but the children had, repent, had repeated their sins, and they were suffering the consequences of their own acts. The prophet now emphasizes individual responsibility for sin. See verse 31. So that's what it means by sour grapes and their teeth set on age. We are all punished for our own sins. I can't be punished for my parents' due, for their sins. But I can be influenced by their sins. And that's what he's referring to, that through the years, Judah, the generations have been influenced by the past examples of the past generation. But one day we will all be individually judged according to our own individual choices. But as parents, we need to know we can't influence our kids to do wrong. This proverb conveyed the idea that children are affected by what their parents are and do. Apparently, the Jews had erroneously set a stigma on the children of known sinners, overlooking the qualifying statement in Exodus 25-6. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. What he's saying is, is unfortunately, when wicked parents set an example, it goes down through the generations. That example is passed on because of their bad example. In this chapter, Jeremiah set the Jew straight. See also Ezekiel 18, 4, 1 through 4. The, which says, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, What mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on age. As I live, saith the Lord God, ye shall have you shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine, as the souls of the Father, so also the souls of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And so it sounds like they were trying to excuse their sins. Of, well, my parents made me do that. And they're saying, no, no, we're not using that proverb anymore. You're responsible for your own actions. Nothing in Exodus 25 through 6 justifies that. In a final sense, children are punished are punished for their parents' sins. Nevertheless, as President Spencer W. Kimball shows, children may suffer the consequences of parental sins. See, there's that influence that may come. Here's what President Kimball said. There is the man who resists release from position in the church. He knew positions were temporary trusts, but he criticized the priesthood leaders who released him, complaining that proper recognition had not been given, time had not been propitious, it had been a reflection upon his effectiveness. He bitterly built up a case for himself, 
absented himself from his meetings and justified himself in his resultant estrangement. His children partook of his frustrations and his children's children. In later life, he came to himself and on the brink of the grade made an about face. His family would not affect the transformation which now he would give his life to have them make. How selfish! His haughty pride induced eating sour grapes, and innocent ones have their teeth set on edge. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. We can affect our children, and we have to be careful of that. When I was a child, we used the expression, he cut off his nose to spite his face. To this, that meant that one was fighting against fate, rebelling against the inevitable, damaging himself to spite others, breaking his toe to give vent to his senseless anger. Eight lovely children had blessed the temple marriage of a man and woman who in later years were denied a temple recommend. They would not be so dealt with by this young bishop. They they sh why should they be deprived and humiliated? Were they less worthy than others? They argued that this boy bishop was too strict, too orthodox. Never would they be active nor enter the door of that church as long as the bishop presided. They would show him. The history of his family is tragic. The four young ones were never baptized. The four older ones never were ordained, endowed, nor sealed. No missions were fulfilled by this family. Today the parents are ill at ease, still defiant. They have covered themselves with the cloud, and righteous prayers cannot pass through. Sour grapes, such unhappy food. Gospel Principle we are all individually accountable to God for our sins. However, parents' unrighteous example can affect their children. Jeremiah 31, 20 through 40. Continuing. 31, verses 31 through 40 deal with the restoration of the gospel through the prophet Joseph Smith and the day when God's covenant will truly be established with his people. Joseph Smith said of that day, the time has at last arrived when the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob has set his hand again the second time to recover the remnants of his people and establish that covenant with them which was promised when their sins would be taken away. This covenant has never been established with the house of Israel, nor with the house of Judah, for it requires two parties to make a covenant, and those two parties must be agreed, or nor covenant can be made. Christ, in the day of his flesh, proposed to make a covenant with them, but they rejected him and his proposals, and in consequence thereof they were broken off, and no covenant was made with them at that time. But their unbelief has not rendered the promise of God of none effect. No, for there was another day limited in David, which was the day of his power. And then his people Israel should be a willing people. And he would write his law in their hearts and print it in their thoughts. And their sins and their iniquities would he would remember no more. Thus, after this chosen family had rejected Christ and his proposals, the heralds of salvation said unto them, Lo, we turn unto the Gentiles. And the Gentiles received the covenant and were grafted in from whence the chosen family were broken off. But the Gentiles have not continued in the goodness of God, but have departed from the faith that was once delivered to the saints, and have broken the covenant in which their fathers were established." And now, what remains to be done under circumstances like these? I will proceed to tell you what the Lord requires of all people, high and low, rich and poor, male and female, ministers and people, professors of religion and non-professors, in order that they may enjoy the Holy Spirit of God to a fullness and escape the judgments of God, which are almost ready to burst upon the nations of the earth. Repent of all your sins, and be baptized in water for the remission of them, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, and receive the ordinance of the laying on of hands of him who is ordained and sealed unto this power, that you, you may receive the Holy Spirit of God.
And this is according to the Holy Scriptures and the Book of Mormon, and the only way that man can enter into the celestial kingdom. These are the requirements of the new covenant. 31 verses 36 to 37, the Lord who has worked so long and hard to establish his righteous people said that if those saving and exalting priesthood ordinance cease to exist, then Israel will also cease to exist forever. This statement surely indicates the importance of ordinances in the Lord's plan. 31 verses 38 through 40, Jerusalem in her future extension is to enclose spaces hitherto considered unclean, meaning Israel one day will become great and spacious. Many people. We have yet to see the gathering of Israel and the great miracle that is about to come about. Jeremiah chapter 32, Jeremiah imprisoned by Zedekiah. Jeremiah 32, 1 through 5, Jeremiah is imprisoned by Zedekiah for prophesying the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians and the capture of Zedekiah being led captive to Babylon. 32, verses 6 through 15, Jeremiah purchase, purchases, Jeremiah's purchase of Anathoth an interesting example of legal proceedings in connection with Hebrew land customs. If land was to be sold, it was the duty of the nearest of kin to buy it, so that it should not pass from one family to another. Jeremiah bought the estate as next heir by the right of redemption. Jeremiah made out two copies of the deed. One to be sealed, the other left open the former to be referred to in case at any time it were suspect that the latter had been tampered with. 32, verse 16 to 25, Jeremiah cannot reconcile the obvious sense of the transaction which he had just carried out the Lord's command with the overflow which had been so often bidden to announce to the guilty city. So why did you have me buy this land and go through this legal procedure when you're just going to overthrow the city. Verses 26 to 27, Jehovah challenges Jeremiah's concerns and asks, is there anything too hard for me? Just because you, Jeremiah, do not know the end from the beginning does not mean that I don't know what I am doing. Okay, there's a reason why I had you buy land, even though is, Jerusalem is about ready to be conquered. Verses 32, 28-35 Yes, because Israel and Judah turned to the worship of Baal and done evil for Beho before Jehovah, provoking him to anger, which means justice, turning their backs on Jehovah, even to the point of child sacrifice, they will be destroyed and taken captive to Babylon. So Jehovah says, yes, you are right, Jeremiah. That is going to happen. What you have been prophesying is true. Verses 36 through 34. However, resuming the thought, is anything too hard for me? However, Jeremiah, Jehovah informs Jeremiah that through his matchless power, Israel and Judah will one day be gathered and brought again to dwell safely, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. They will be given one heart and one way to fear the Lord through an everlasting covenant that will not be broken. Here we see words similar to that of the establishment of Zion in Enoch's day. And the Lord called his people Zion because they are of one heart and one mind and dwelt in righteousness, and there was no poor among them. That's why I had you by the land. It's symbolic that one day you will return, Jeremiah. Your people will return. And dwell in one heart and one mind with the Lord as a Zion people. Is anything too hard for me? Can I not do that in the future? Thus showing that Jehovah will in the latter days again establish his Zion and a Zion people. Gospel principle, true unity will only come as we turn our hearts and minds to Christ in his will. You cannot legislate unity. It only come if we have one heart and one mind united in Christ. 
Jeremiah 33, verses 3 through 14, prophecy of the latter days. The Lord knows all things, including the future. Prophecy is future history, that is, history in reverse. In Jeremiah 33, 3-14, the Lord again spoke of the restoration of Israel and Judah in the latter days. Notice the language he used to describe the process. I will cure them, I will cleanse them, I will pardon all their iniquities, verses 6 and 8. In the latter days, even the desolate land will be restored to its former condition, verse 12. The cities that were once desolate will again be full of people and their bounteous flocks. To tell means to count, verse 13. In the latter days, the Lord will perform all that he has promised to the house of Israel and the house of Judah, verse 14. Gospel principle, all the prophecies of Jehovah will be fulfilled in his time and in his way. If anything the Old Testament teaches, we can trust Jehovah that things will happen when he says they will happen. God will fulfill his promises. So in the latter days, as we are facing such perilous times and things are going to get more confusing, more wicked, more scattered, we must put our trust that the promises, the promises that Israel will be gathered, the promise that the ten tribes will turn, the promise that the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will prosper and grow and be the nucleus for the kingdom of God will one day take place. Jeremiah 33, 15 through 16, the branch of David. The branch of righteousness that will grow up into David and execute judgment and righteousness in the land, verse 15, is Jesus Christ. When this millennial event occurs, the Jews will dwell safely in Jerusalem. And it's probably a millennial condition when we finally see the Jews converting to the church, dwelling safely in Jerusalem and becoming a people under the covenant. Right now, covenant Israel is not in Jerusalem. You have Jews there, but they're not Israel. There's no covenant there. One day, there'll be covenant there and a temple. The last part of verse 16 is not a particularly good translation, since it implies that Jerusalem herself will be called the Lord of our righteousness. According to Adam Clark, it should read, Quote, and this one who shall call her is the Lord of our justification. That is Jesus Christ himself, the branch of David. Jeremiah 33, 16 through 26, becoming sons and daughters of Christ. The seed of David are those who repent of their sins, accept the ordinances of the gospel, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, and follow the new David, Jesus Christ. King Benjamin explained this concept to his people after they had signified their willingness to covenant with God to do his will and be obedient to his commandments. See Mosiah 5.7. Abinadi also explained what it meant to be the seed of Christ, saying, Behold, I say unto you that whosoever has heard the words of the prophets, yea, all the holy prophets who have prophesied concerning the coming of the Lord, I say unto you that all those who have hearkened unto their words and believed that the Lord would redeem his people and have looked forward to the day for remission of their sins, I say unto you that these are his seed, or they are the heirs of the kingdom of God. For these are they whose sins he has borne. These are they for whom he has died to redeem them from their transgressions, and now are they not his seed? Yea, and are not the prophets, every one that has opened his mouth to prophesy, that has not fallen into transgression, I mean all the holy prophets of the since the world began, I say unto you that they are his seed. Jeremiah 36, Jeremiah's prophecies are written down. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> The prophecies concerning Israel and Judah are now ended, and we have here, in chapter 36, the record of the embodying in a permanent form by Jeremiah of the substance of these prophecies. Baruch, Jeremiah's scribe, records the prophecies of Jeremiah, which are then read in the house of the Lord, that it may be the house of Judah would turn from their evil ways. So a record's made of all the prophecies. 
as it was in the chamber of Micaiah's father that Baruch had been allowed to read the roll, Gemariah, who was engaged at a council of leading men in another room, would naturally be desirous to learn as soon as might be what had occurred. Barak was invited to read the words of the book to all the princes of Judah, who then relayed to King Jehoiakim the words they had heard. Thereupon the king sent for the book, had it read to him as a result of which the king burned it in the fire that was burning in his room. 3624 gives the reaction to the contents of Jeremiah's prophecies, the destruction of Jerusalem. So you catch that? Jeremiah writes down the prophecies. He tells Baruch to read them in the temple. He reads them in the temple. Micaiah reads them and his father, Gemara, hears them. He takes them to the princes and Judah says, look what Jeremiah just wrote down. They then tell the king, the king says, bring, read them and bring them to me. And they do, and the king burns them. It doesn't lie. Evidently, if you get rid of scripture, then they won't happen. Uh, evidently, that's the thought process here. Kind of a stupid one. Oh, kind of like people today. Well, if I leave the church, then it won't be true. It'll be fine. Everything will be fine. Yet, this is, this is their reaction to when they burnt them and, and the prophecies of destruction that were coming. Yet they, the king and the princes, were not afraid, nor rent their garments, neither the king nor any of his servants that heard all these words. It didn't faze them a bit, caused no remorse, nothing. Let's just get rid of the prophet, that way we'll get rid of the problem. If I just deny the truth, it will go away. Yet that's good. What a contrast to the reaction of Joachim's father, Josiah, when he heard the words of the Lord. Now, this is from 2 King. Notice when he hears what the Lord says and what his reaction is to it versus uh, what Jehoiakim was that we just read. 2 Kings 22, 8-20. And Hilkiah, the high priest, said unto Saphon, the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. And Shaphan the scribe came to the king, and brought the king word again, and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house, and have delivered it into the hands of them that do work, and they ha that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the, the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law, he rent his clothes. He's in deep sorrow and suffering because he understands Israel has not been living the commandments and they're in trouble. And so he shows his grief. He shows his remorse. And the king commanded Hilkiah, the priest, and Akam, the son of Shaphan, the, and Akbor, the son of Machia, and and Shaphan, the scribe, and Asiah, the servant of king, saying, Go ye inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book, to do according to all that which has been written in us. They read the law, the words of Moses, and realized, Oh my God, we have not been keeping the law, and therefore destruction is imminent. Go find out if this is really true. So Ilkiah the priest, and Akam, and Akbor, and Shaphan, and Asiah, went unto Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikva, the son of Haras, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the college, and they communed with her. And she said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man that sent you to me. Thus saith the Lord. Now, why they had to go to a prophetess just means the late as a testimony of Jesus shows you maybe the fallen condition of the righteous leadership of men in Jerusalem at the time and in Israel at the time. She's the only one that had the spirit of prophecy, evidently. Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah hath read. Because they have forsaken me, have burnt incense unto other gods, that they might provoke me to anger and all the works of their hands. There, therefore my wrath shall be kindled against this place, and shall not be quenched. But to the king of Judah, which sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall ye say to him, 
Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, as touching the words which thou hast heard. Because thine heart was tender, and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord, when thou heardest what I spake against this place, and against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and has rent thy clothes, and wept before me, I also have heard thee, saith the Lord. Behold, therefore, I will gather thee unto thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered into the grave in peace, and thine eyes shall not see all the evil which I will bring upon this place. And they brought king word again. Josiah, what an interesting reaction. What's our reaction when we are called to repentance? Do we just get mad at the prophet or our bishop or state president or whomever it may be and refuse to rent our clothing, in other words, to have remorse? Or are we like Josiah who hears that Israel has not been living up to their covenants and has remorse? and wants to turn and follow. Therefore, Jehovah saves him. It's our choice. We'll respond either way. Continuing, then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. After that, the king had burned the roll. So this is going back to now, after the king, we'll go back to the story in Jeremiah. The words which Baruch wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah, saying, take thee again another roll. Yeah, like God, like God couldn't have done this, right? You, you see this all the time with the apostates. We'll just leave and we'll try to destroy them like God cannot do his own work. Take thee again another roll and write in it all the former words which were in the first roll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, hath burned. And thou shalt say to Jehoiakim, king of Judah, thus saith the Lord, Thou hast burned this roll, saying, Why hast thou written therein, saying, The king of Babylon shall certainly come and destroy this land, and shall cause to cease from thence man and beast. Therefore, thus saith the Lord to King Jehoiakim, king of Judah, he shall have none to sit upon the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast out into the day, to the heat, and to the night, to the frost. And I will punish him and his seed and his servants for their iniquity. And I will bring upon them, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and upon the men of Judah, all the evil that I have pronounced against them. But they hearken. Hopefully we're not as stupid, as stubborn, and as prideful. Gospel principle, brothers and sisters, God will not be mocked. Let's finish up with Lamentations chapter 1 and 3. Though the five poems, I mean the five chapters, contain this book have practically the same theme, the downfall of Jerusalem, yet each poem dwells on a different phrase of the subject as intimated in the opening words of each chapter. This first one emphasizes the desolation and misery of the city, describing it as solitary and as a widow and as tributary, that is, Judah has lost her independence and there is no comfort. Verses 2, 9, 17, and 21. Let's take a look at them. Verse 2, She weeps sore in the night, and her tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers she hath none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They are become her enemies. Verse 9, Her filthiness is in her skirts. She remembereth not the, her last end, therefore she came down wonderfully. She had no comforter. O Lord, behold mine affliction, for the enemy hath magnified himself. Verse 17, Zion spreadeth forth her hands, and there is no one to comfort her. The Lord hath commanded concerning Jacob that his adversary should be round about him. Jerusalem is as a menstruous woman among them. Verse 21, They have heard that I sigh. There is none to comfort me. All mine enemies have heard of my trouble. They are glad that thou hast done it. Thou wilt bring the day that thou hast called, and they shall be like unto me. And so any form of comfort has left Jerusalem and in in, in Judah, the kingdom of Judah. And, and Jeremiah is lamenting that because he knows how horrible this is going to be. There is no comforting peace of the Holy Spirit with them. It's gone because of the choices they made. This third poem, poem, Lamentations 3, is the most elaborate in structure and the most sublime in, through, in thought of all. 
the poet speaks not only for himself, but for the nation. The order of thought in the poem is for sorrow, confession, repentance, and prayer. And so as you read that, I hope that'll help you to make some sense of it and to see how it's structured. Gospel principle. I, the Lord God, make you free. Therefore, ye are free indeed, and the law also maketh you free. Nevertheless, when the wicked rule, the people mourn. Doctrine and Covenants 98, 8 through 9. Judah learned the hard way that when the wicked rule, the people mourn. Only God and his law will free us, brothers and sisters. May we have the sense to follow it, regardless of what society or others say. The truth of things as they are, as they were, and as they will be, is that the God and his laws is what sets us free. Only obedience to them will we find freedom, happiness, and joy. Thank you for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed the presentation and please subscribe to the channel.